Today we are going to continue the story we tell each and every Christmas Eve, mostly from the narrative of the Gospel of Luke, from the birth of Jesus' miraculous birth and the small glimpse we have into his childhood. And we're going we're gonna to read the scripture and then I'm, I'm basically going to interrupt myself every couple of verses and talk about some of the verses that are um, the context of them. So what you, could, you could say this is a reading of the scripture with commentary. <laughs> so we'll begin in uh, verse, verse 41. Now every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. Uh, Mary and Joseph are devout practicing Jews, and so to make the festival of the Passover, you have to make a pilgrimage. It's not as if there's a church every other block like there is now that the temple was centralized in Jerusalem, and so to celebrate the Passover, you had to make the journey there. The journey from where they lived took about four to five days, and it covered 15 miles a day. Now, if I went over to Bivouac and bought really good sturdy hiking shoes and a fancy backpack to put everything in, I could probably make that journey, maybe. But I can't imagine making that journey with a child of age 2 or 12. And yet the scripture is, is opening up with saying that this is a family who from the time Jesus was born was making this four to five day journey with their child. And so here they are uh, at, at year 12 of Jesus' life making the journey once again. And it says, when he was 12 years old, they went up as usual for the festival. Now, the author tells us about two or three times in this text that either Jesus is 12 or that he is a child. And it's important because in Jewish culture, age 13 marks the time of adulthood. I don't know how many 13-year-olds you know, but this should... (laughs) It's question how, how much of an adult they are at 13, but it is, again, an antiquity and, and different, uh, different circumstances. But in that time and in that culture, age 13 was the time of adulthood. So this is the year before, like his last year of childhood. And the next line of scripture tries to emphasize this, saying, the boy Jesus. And it's important because only here in the Gospel of Luke, only in this passage, is is all we know about Jesus' childhood. No other gospel speaks of it. So the story continues, and he says, When the festival was ended and they started to return, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know it. Assuming that he was in a group of travelers, they went a day's journey. Then they started to look for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. So before we start judging Mary and Joseph for their neglectful parenting, uh, let's look at the situation for a minute. First of all, it it was antiquity. So any semblance of helicopter parenting was not in practice. The culture of parenting then was was about uh, obedience and, and independence, trying to trying to survive. It was more survival-based. And pilgrimages to the Holy City were, were family and friend affairs. You were going in a group of 30 people. And so it was common that children would run to and fro and, and hang out with kids their age and run up ahead. And when time was, there was time to eat, it was the women who prepared food and they would just feed whichever family and friends were around them at that time. So it would be, have been common for a 12-year-old boy to have been running around and maybe not see his parents most of the day. And finally, the, the three days we read, because when I first read that as a parent, I'm like, how do you not see your kid for three days and not know where they are? And, uh, but they, Luke doesn't actually say when the three days starts counting back from. It could be three days since they had seen Jesus. It could be three days since they had decided to turn back and journey to Jerusalem. Or it could have been three days from the time they got to Jerusalem to start searching. We don't, we don't really know, because truthfully, that's not what is important to the author. What the author's trying to communicate at this point in the story is that the conflict has been solved. Boy, Jesus has been located, and he is in the temple. So the next part of the story is the uh, punishment of worried parents that's probably about to be unfurled. So the parents are understandably filled with anxiety and frustration. And yet at this point, the people in the temple are giving Jesus loads of positive feedback. 
Now, if you're a parent, you know that that is super unhelpful when you're trying to correct a behavior and everyone else around seems to be applauding the very behavior you're trying to correct. But in any case, we we read on to hear this crowd's support of Jesus. In verse 47, they say, All who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. Don't you wonder what Mary really said to him? (laughs) Here she is. She's addressing a 12-year-old who's technically a child, but yes, should have known better than to neglect telling his parents he just planned to stay back in Jerusalem for a couple days. I'm sure that verse 48 was the smoothed over version of what really came out of her mouth in that moment. But Jesus' response was certainly not what she had expected. As in many places in the gospel, later in Jesus' life, Jesus responds to this question of his mother by another question. He said to them, why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be at my father's house? Wow, it sounds like the moody response of a pre-adolescent if I ever heard one. (laughs) And also, as Joseph, Mary has just referred to Joseph as Jesus' father. She said, your father and I have been searching for you. So what a zinger this comment must have been to Joseph to hear, did you not know I must have been at my father's house? Ouch. Ouch. We don't know fully how they responded, but the text tells us in verse 50 that they did not understand what he, Jesus, said to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother treasured all these things in her heart. That phrase is used often in Luke as Mary as a mother to, baby, to this baby Jesus and now boy Jesus, this phrase, treasured in her heart, is not as we might hear it. It's not like this awesome scrapbook moment that Mary is just holding on to dearly and, and tucking away. It's rather moments where she, she received a divine glimpse about what kind of baby or boy or soon man she would be the mother of. And so every time the scripture tells us she treasured this in her heart, It's telling us that there is a sign that this boy, her boy, she would sooner than later have to relinquish to God. And so the story ends with the most generic conclusion of Jesus' life from age 12 to 30. This is all we get in our scriptures about what happened. It's summed up as, And Jesus increased in wisdom and in years, and in divine and human favor. This is one of my favorite stories in the entire Bible because we get a glimpse not only as to what, what Jesus' childhood might have been like, but we also get a glimpse into the incredible struggle it must have been to be Mary, to have the task of carrying and raising and then relinquishing her miraculous, beloved firstborn son. Here on the heels of Christmas, we hear a story that is so ordinary, so human, so relatable to our own. After the adoring shepherds and the singing angel and the wise magi that brought really expensive gifts, after a dramatic birth and a stable, things seem remarkably normal. The 12-year-old boy disobeys his parents. The parents had a what are we going to do with him conversation. He challenges his parents. He talks back, he probably rolled his eyes. He is proclaiming desires and expectations for his life that deviate from the desires and expectations that his parents have for him. Well, that sounds a great deal like parenting to me. Mary, as a young mother, had made it through nursing and weaning and the terrible twos, and now she has entered into the realm of adolescence. Despite all the dark and lofty prophecies that were made about her son, she and Joseph are living a somewhat ordinary life. Her husband is a carpenter, and she's a wife and a mother. She's making a home and nurturing her family. In that time and culture, male children took over their father's work. 
And so they would begin apprenticing when they hit age 13, and they would learn their father's trade with impeccable detail so that when it was time for them to take a wife and begin a family, they had a way to provide for that family. This was the expectation of child rearing at the time, was obedience and loyalty and care. And if perchance something happened to Joseph, it was Mary's expectation that Jesus would take her in and care for her. Widows were a very vulnerable population at that time, and they required care of a male family member for survival. So even at 12, these were the expectations that were set before this divine child. And yes, Mary knew from prophecy that Jesus would have other roles and that the expectations that the prophets put on his very small shoulders were greater than these familial ones. But at 12, picturing her boy as this promised, fearless leader seemed a far-off reality. Like many children, Jesus' expectations differed from his parents. While he loved Joseph, he claimed a different father. He was raised in this practicing Jewish family, and so he had become accustomed to hearing the scriptures read at festivals. He had sat on the floor and listened to the teaching of the rabbis before. His expectations were not about carpentry, but rather about religion. He wanted to become a rabbi, to teach, to interpret, to fulfill this Jewish law in a way that had never been done before. He would go on to fulfill this law and to teach in a way that upset most of the leaders of this system. He knew as a son of Mary and Joseph that they had their expectations too, that he should be obedient, maybe even humor Joseph a bit and learn this carpentry trade. But all the while, those expectations were subverted to his greater calling, to his father as God, not as carpenter. His expectations were far bigger than what Nazareth could hold. And it's a familiar story, is it not? When your hopes and dreams for your children aren't the same that they hold for themselves. When they desire the life of an artist or a musician over the life of an investment banker. When they desire independence and have no interest in partnering or having children. Like Mary, we might ask, child, Why have you treated me in this way? Whenever our expectations fall short or they're not met, we ask this question, whether you're a parent or not. We ask it in our families. We ask it to God. We ask it to our systems of employment. Why have you treated me in this way? Because shattered expectations are really hard. In the pieces of those shattered expectations, however, God presents us with new expectations, ones we could never have imagined, expectations that exceed the ones we began with. And sometimes we are so hurt and so blinded, it is difficult to see that God is staking his claim and proclaiming a different set of expectations that will actually transform our lives for the better. We might be throwing up our hands or living in anxiety or completely exasperated like Mary and Joseph, but God is patiently planting our souls with opportunities and expectations that cannot be held in Nazareth or Ann Arbor or Celine or Dexter. When our expectations are shattered, sometimes it's because God is planted to go far beyond those expectations. As a mom, this was really helpful for me the week after Christmas. Christmas, a time when parental expectations for correct behavior and manners runs at an all-time high. For those who don't know my kids, I've got twin boys. They're both seven. And one is a rule follower, and one is not. (laughs) And I overheard uh, the one who does not follow the rules as much explain it to a classmate at school. He didn't know I was listening and standing behind him, and he He turns to his friend and he says, yeah, my brother and I are twins, but we're really different. He sits and listens, and I jump off furniture. (laughs) And the student nodded like this was a completely legitimate way to sum up the differences. Uh, But to his credit, it was a pretty accurate, (laughs) pretty accurate sum. These characteristics, uh, they were there from the beginning. I remember 
one, it was a Tuesday, thankfully, and not a Sunday, but the kids were in the, in the sanctuary with me, and, and Britton went up to the balcony for the first time. And I'm over here, and all of a sudden, I hear this clamor. And he had taken a Bible, not even the hymn, though, the Bible, and thrown it over the balcony. It just narrowly missed that grand piano and clamored to the floor. And I turned to him, and I said, why would you do that? And he was telling me about uh, one of those flyers that have books with wings that are like, books, reading, opens your mind. So he was testing out this hypothesis that the book had wings. He was a little disappointed when it did not. Britton is the kid that brought the red balloon to the Christmas pageant one year and proceeded to bat it around like with the sheeps. Just the other day, he, after Children's Circle and all the kids go downstairs, Britton is laying face down underneath a pew, and Chris Vermeulen and I had to pull him out by his ankles while the offering is starting to take him down to church school. Meanwhile, Jake has memorized the Lord's Prayer and is asking when he gets to go downstairs and visit his church school teachers. Most recently on, on Christmas Eve, uh, it's, you know, an angelic, magical night, and my family's sitting right here, and the, Britain has got his um, communion. They'd never taken communion before in church, or not that they could remember it. So he gets, he gets the grape juice passed out, and he turns to my dad, and what he thinks is a whisper, it says, what is this stuff? My dad's like, it's, it's grape juice. Wait, you know, wait, we'll all, we'll all wait till your mom says to drink it, and we can all drink it together. Well, do you think he waited? No. He knocked that back like he was drinking other things, and he um, asked for another one immediately after. <laughs> So managing my expectations over and above this child's assertions has left me as exasperated as Mary was that day with Joseph. She's left me in a way, not that I'm treasuring things in my heart, but in a way that I'm praying desperately for patience and parenting this willful child. <laughs> the thing is, when your kids don't meet your expectations, sometimes it's because they're going to go beyond your expectations. At the beginning of December, many of you know, Brian Connolly uh, lost his wife. Mary passed away. And so at the house, I was baking cookies to take them over to Brian. And I suggested that the boys color pictures to um, try to teach them how we care for our church family. And to my joy, they were more than willing to color these pictures. So they selected these pictures and colored them carefully at the table. I told them how to spell Brian so that they could... Um, write a two and to, to sign their names on it. Well, they completed the task and scampered away from the table, leaving you know, all the crayons and, and drawings there. And so when I went to clean them up, I picked up Britain's coloring page and found this. Written in gray crayon, and I don't know if you can see it, on the right-hand side are the letters you are not alone. I stopped very abruptly from cleaning up and tears filled my eyes. Because in those words, written by my furniture jumping boy, God had taken my shattered expectations of behavior and gone above and beyond. With these words, unprovoked, written in love with a gray crayon. Friends, as you begin the work of letting go all that 2018 brought, as you pick up pieces of whatever shattered expectations lie about, remember in faith that Jesus came to claim his own set of expectations and that those expectations go beyond our imaginations and transform our hearts and lives. May yours be transformed this day and into 2019. Amen.